I'm Nathan Zampronio, one of your councillors on Hawkesbury City Council. Recently, I went to Canberra to attend the Australian Local Government Assembly. It was a great opportunity to meet with a range of agencies and organisations to learn how to serve the community better. We were briefed about the COVID global pandemic. Some of the statistics that were presented were new to me and really surprised me, and I wanted to share them with you. One briefing was from Professor Mary Louise McClaws, an epidemiologist from the University of New South Wales. The professor had some chilling statistics about COVID and vaccine, vaccine effectiveness. And another was from Danielle Wood, the CEO of the Gratan Institute, a heavyweight and independent economic think tank. Danielle spoke about the economic impacts of the pandemic. Now I'm relying on the notes and pictures that I took of the presentation slides and I offer attribution and thanks to the respective authors. The first insight relates to just how different the Delta strain of the COVID virus is compared to what we're used to. There are three attributes of concern in a virus. How catchy it is, how long you can have it without manifesting symptoms, allowing people to become unwitting super spreaders, and then how deadly it is once you have it. Delta is worse in two out of those three. This new strain, which originated in Maharashtra state in India, is between 70 and 90 percent more virulent than the strain that we were dealing with for most of last year. People can carry the Delta strain for longer without realising it. Damien Purcell has also found something about the Delta variant that could be very worrying. You may carry it for longer without knowing it. It's uh, slower to announce its symptoms, which might be one of the more significant points. So containment strategies are even more important now. Face masks, stay-at-home orders and lockdowns. On the other side, there's evidence that Delta may be slightly less lethal, possibly because it seems to hit younger people who are better able to fight it off. That makes this week's announcement that people under 40 can get vaccinated a real game changer. Concerning vaccines, both the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines are overwhelmingly safe. And if there's one message that I have for you among, above all others, it's this. Please get vaccinated as soon as you can. Book it with your GP or hop onto the Service New South Wales app. According to John Dwyer, immunologist an emeritus professor of medicine at University of New South Wales, only one person per million is likely to die of the complications of thrombosis associated with vaccination. You're far more likely to die of COVID if you're not vaccinated. There was something on the news only last night that really drove home that point. And if you're reluctant to be vaccinated, have a look at this. There were roughly 30 people at the West Hoxton party, 24 now have COVID. Not one of those 24 people were vaccinated. I can also advise that six health workers who attended at that party who were fully vaccinated, not one of those people has been infected. However, there is something worth knowing about the relative effectiveness of the two vaccines made by AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Both vaccines are less effective against the Delta strain than the old strain. The data clearly shows that it's critically important that you get both doses and that your immunity can more than double after the second dose. Also, the Pfizer vaccine is somewhat more effective overall. But that shouldn't make you an AstraZeneca holdout. The best vaccine, bar none, is the one that's available now and soon. Don't wait if there is no valid medical reason not to. And next, here's what you need to know about the profile of COVID outbreaks. Data from the Victorian outbreak in May and the Sydney outbreak before Christmas showed that outbreaks have peaked in around 14 days, taken as a 14-day rolling average. The last New South Wales outbreak ended after 33 days. And the return to baseline levels, usually seen as necessary for lightened restrictions, is 46 days. We're at the end of the first week of the new Sydney outbreak, 
But these figures may have been for the less catchy strains, so we have a long way to go. Next, the statistics overwhelmingly show that breaches in our quarantine system are to blame for most outbreaks, and no particular state deserves all the blame. The New South Wales system fares better than most, being run by the ADF and the police. Outsourced arrangements seem to fare poorly, and the general message is that, from an economic perspective, the cost of a purpose-built quarantine facility would be cheaper than the cost of even a single major city lockdown. There used to be a time when this was self-evident. Quarantine, like the defence of the nation, customs and border control, is a federal responsibility, not the state's. It's right there in the Constitution. Those of you who, like me, have visited the Sydney quarantine station know that this is how our forebears, better acquainted with disease than, it, than, than we, it seems, dealt with quarantine. The data shows that hotels are not optimal quarantine venues. Next is where we are compared to the rest of the world. Israel have fully vaccinated 57% of their population. The UK, 49%. The US, 47%. And Singapore, 36 At the 28th of June, only 4.7% of Australians have been fully vaccinated although 23.9% of Australians have had their first dose. However, this is also because in Australia there have only been 910 deaths in total from COVID, while in the US, for example, the toll now tops 604,000. In terms of deaths per capita worldwide, we are spectacularly lucky. In Peru, this many people have died per million population. In the UK, it's this much, and in the US. In Australia, the figure is only 36 deaths per million head of population. That's between 51 and 164 times lower mortality than all of the others, and that's largely because our governments took the relevant scientific advice early and implemented measures. We would need to deliver 155,000 jabs a month using all available vaccine types to get to herd immunity by the end of the year. We're currently tracking at about 110,000 doses per month. Unfortunately, so-called vaccine hesitancy is a major risk, with 26% of survey respondents stating that they're unlikely to get the jab. Without herd immunity, usually cited as 85, 90% or higher in a community, outbreaks can still occur. A breakdown of the numbers shows that only 5% of those who are hesitant are your stereotypical tinfoil hat wearing anti vaxxers. And I use that term advisedly. Those misguided people are endangering us at all. But most people who are hesitant have legitimate concerns about the potential side effects for their age group, have particular medical circumstances, or just want more information, which is why I'm making this video. Vaccination is safe and effective. The side effects are rare, and the benefits outweigh the very small risks. And here are some facts about the economic impacts of COVID. COVID delivered the biggest temporary hit to Australia's growth since records started being kept in 1930. It beats every other economic downturn, hands down. But this chart shows that not only is the relative death toll lower for Australia, but the relative economic impact has been far lower than for other developed nations. The UK, EU and Canada have all been hit harder, economically speaking. But relative to other economic downturns, such as the GFC of 2007 or the recessions of the 1980s and 1990s, the overall impact of COVID has been shallower. It doesn't seem like that because its impact has been so much more visible and has hit vulnerable sectors of the economy. The recovery is likely to be stronger, much stronger, than coming back from these other downturns because the dip was artificially induced, rather than due to any deficiency in underlying demand. 
disposable income to Australian households is higher now than before the crisis. Although I do disagree with this chart because it, it doesn't show the differential effect of COVID on different people. Those of you who are working in the service or retail economy might not feel better off at all. But to employ a metaphor, our economy is running on sugar at the moment. It's a massive stimulus spike funded by us, the taxpayers. And the net result is deficits as far as the eye can see. Although it's worth observing, when we compare the predictions of recovery from this crisis with the predictions made at the height of others, the track record of economic forecasters and governments only have two things in common. They are spectacularly optimistic and usually wrong. I am concerned at what has been termed modern monetary theory, abandons the idea of debt as bad. Running surplus budgets and lowering public debt used to be an article of faith for right of centre, fiscally prudent governments. So government spending and taxes should always be lower and government itself should always be smaller under the coalition than under Labor. The overriding economic goal of the next coalition government will be to return the budget to surplus and to pay off Labor's debt. My own view is that of Edmund Burke, the father of modern conservatism. Society is a contract between those who have gone before, those alive today, and those yet to be born. We should not be in any doubt. The money that the government has borrowed to meet the needs of the current emergency doesn't come from nowhere. It's borrowed from future generations. Thanks for watching.